Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. In my life, I've learned that it's important to question everything, even your spouse. Ignoring problems won't make them go away. So, I decided to confront my wife about her cheating. It was a tough journey. What was supposed to be a relaxing two-week vacation turned into a stressful two-day drive home, with only quick stops for gas, bathroom breaks, and fast food. When we got home late, there wasn't much food to eat. The next morning, I rushed to work and grabbed some donuts and coffee on the way. My surprise return to the office caught everyone off guard. I didn't have time for a proper lunch, so I just had cheese crackers and soda at my desk. On top of it all, I got in trouble with my boss for someone else's mistake. Returning home, I spotted my wife Lori driving down the street, trailed by a rental truck, destination unknown to me. I reached for a power protein bar from the cooler we had taken on the unfortunate trip. The contents we packed remained untouched. The ice had melted, rendering everything warm and soggy, including the protein bar, which was now inedible. I noticed many of Lori's belongings from before our marriage were missing from the living room. In the bedroom, her childhood dresser and chest of drawers were gone, along with all her belongings and the empty closet. In the kitchen, three dirty coffee cups sat on the island, while her family's china and crystal were nowhere to be seen. None of this came as a surprise. The trip was intended to address some issues that had arisen in our two-year marriage. To be frank, we only had one major issue, but it was significant whether or not to be unfaithful. My stance was firmly against cheating. One of the songs played by the DJ at our reception encapsulated our situation well. It spoke of getting married in a fever. That resonated with us because we'd known each other for only six months before tying the knot. Do you realize how many people warned us against rushing into marriage? The answer is almost everyone I knew or was related to. The same went for her. But we were blinded by love and convinced we knew better than everyone else. God, we were such fools. The fever of passion described in the reception song faded quickly after we were pronounced husband and wife. The issues began almost immediately, even before the wedding cake had gone stale. It all started with her boss's son, a college football player who believed he was entitled to anything he desired. His father acquired the car dealership where my wife was employed. In our small town, there are six new car dealerships, and after Martin Justin Jr. purchased the one where Lori worked, he owned three of them. Lori had been employed there for four years and played a key role in getting my cousin Jeffrey hired to detail the cars. Jeffrey was well-liked and trusted by everyone who knew him. Though not the sharpest or quickest individual, Jeffrey enjoyed his job of cleaning cars and performed it admirably. He also possessed decent mechanical skills but lacked the confidence to pursue it full-time. Jeffrey was a groomsman at my wedding and also my cousin, but we were close friends too. At first, Justin's son didn't come to the car dealership much because he was busy with school. But when summer came, he started coming more often. He liked hanging out in the mostly female office. Lori's desk became his favorite place to be. At first, Lori found him annoying. Then she stopped talking about him, so I figured he either left her alone or bothered someone else. One evening, Jeff was quiet as we sat on the porch of our rented house. He liked beer but didn't handle alcohol well, so I always had non-alcoholic beer for him. If he noticed, he never said anything. Don't misunderstand him. He's not unintelligent. He just takes time to grasp things, but once he does, he never forgets and remains fiercely loyal to his friends, especially me. As we sat on the porch, Jeff was unusually quiet, barely touching his drink. He often caught me looking at him. All right, Jeff, what's on your mind? Roger likes Lori. Roger was Justin's son. I chuckled. Everyone likes Lori. Lori likes Roger. No, she doesn't. Tim, I'm not that slow. He spends a lot of time talking to her. Today they went for lunch at the same time and returned together. Lori never went out for lunch. She always ate in the break room and watched game shows on TV. Are you sure? He nodded slowly. That was the first sign of trouble. We didn't discuss it further that evening. When Lori got home, I asked if everything was all right at work and if she had any issues. Everything's fine. Why do you ask? No reason. Roger was bothering you before, but you haven't mentioned him lately. Oh, he's still bothering me, but I can handle it. 
The second, third, and fourth signals came quickly, all from Jeff. They involved inappropriate physical contact, such as his hand on her buttocks or her hand on his leg when they sat close. Although these actions didn't explicitly suggest cheating, they troubled me. Even though I felt worried, I hadn't talked to Lori about it yet. Instead, I asked Jeff to keep an eye on them and tell me if he saw anything wrong. Whenever he saw something inappropriate, he let me know. Usually I would have dealt with the situation right away, but I hesitated for a few reasons. First, I didn't want to think about Lori being unfaithful. Second, I didn't want to deal with people saying I told you so if she did cheat. One afternoon, Jeff called me and said he saw Lori and Jeff kissing in his dad's office. Kissing like that was definitely going too far. That evening, I talked to Lori about it. Initially, she denied everything, but eventually confessed to fooling around and kissing Roger a bit, although she insisted nothing serious occurred. Will anything serious happen? I questioned. Of course not, she replied. I made it abundantly clear that I wouldn't tolerate any more fooling around and kissing, and that any act of adultery would lead to divorce. We can dissolve our marriage as swiftly as we entered it, and I won't hesitate to divorce you if you ever cheat on me. While I never explicitly mentioned knowing about her and Roger, Jeff got fired the next day. It wasn't hard to connect the dots. Although Lori and I never talked about his dismissal, I did express my disapproval of firing someone with a disability, calling it cowardly. I also mentioned the idea of lodging a complaint against Justin with the ADA, though Jeff and I hadn't discussed it. Nobody really considered Jeff as handicapped, just a bit slow, and the talk of filing a complaint was mostly me venting. We hadn't planned any such action. The day after, Jeff was rehired at one of Martin Justin Jr.'s other dealerships, but the employees at his original workplace protested so much that he was reinstated. It was an intriguing study in human dynamics. Nearly everyone at the dealership rallied behind Jeff. Following our conversation and my warning about the ease of divorce, Lori and I had multiple talks about appropriate conduct for married individuals. Chief among them was the understanding that one should never put themselves in a situation that their spouse wouldn't approve of. For instance, while having lunch alone with someone of the opposite sex who isn't a family member might be innocent. It could potentially spark rumors, especially in a small town. Once rumors start, they can spiral out of control tarnishing one's reputation rapidly. After we talked, we thought about our relationship. We decided to take a break to make our love stronger again, like the excitement we felt when we first got married. We planned a trip, got time off work, packed our bags, and started driving. It took us two whole days to get where we were going. At first, the drive was nice, but then something happened. About four hours into the drive, her phone rang. She looked at it but didn't answer just turned off the sound. Less than an hour later, another call came. She held the phone and felt it buzz, making her jump nervously. Just minutes later, she requested a restroom break. We pulled into a large truck stop and I pulled up to a pump. She quickly got out and headed inside. Normally, I dislike drivers who fill their tanks, then leave their vehicles at the pump while they go inside to shop or use the facilities causing delays for others. It's smoother if you park your vehicle after filling up but I found myself guilty of the same behavior this time. As she rushed inside, I followed. She didn't look back and immediately began using her phone once indoors. I said I'd call you when I could. She spoke into the phone. There was a pause. Roger, don't push me, I'll call you back. Another pause. Roger, seriously. She glanced around and I discreetly ducked behind a shelf of snacks watching her. You shouldn't hang up on me like that. Apparently, he did hang up again as she stared at her phone, seemingly lifeless. She didn't bother checking her surroundings this time, just attempted to call him back, but he didn't answer. She was focused on her phone when I approached. Is everything all right? I inquired. Yeah, everything's fine, she replied, glancing at me. I just need to use the restroom, she hurriedly added before rushing away. I went back to the car and refueled it. She emerged with a soda in hand. Glancing at her, I remarked, it's all right, I'll grab my own and headed towards the store. She gazed at me as though it hadn't occurred to her to ask if I wanted anything. Exiting the store with my soda, I noticed she was back on the phone. She finished talking just as I got to the car. 
Quietly, I started the car and drove away. That night, we stayed in a motel. We ordered pizza and went to bed before 10. The next day, we didn't talk much while driving. When we got to our hotel, we ate at the hotel restaurant and went to bed early. I couldn't sleep and noticed her phone lighting up quietly just after 11. She quickly grabbed it and went into the bathroom. I stood outside the closed door trying to listen, but I could only hear two words, please don't. They talked for a couple of minutes, but I couldn't understand what she was saying. I remained in place when she suddenly opened the door, letting out a scream as I startled her. What? What are you doing here? She asked, recognizing me. I was just curious about what you were doing in there. I gestured towards the bathroom. Nothing, just using the bathroom. Did you need your phone for that? Yeah, I used its light so I wouldn't bump into anything on the way. She attempted to pass by me. You forgot to flush. Oh, right. She went back and flushed. Who were you talking to? What? Who were you talking to? Nobody. Why? I knew she was lying and she knew that I knew. I'm going to bed. Tomorrow morning, tell me who you were talking to and what you were discussing or were heading home. We embarked on this trip to resolve things, but that requires honesty from both of us. Keeping secrets won't help if that's our goal. I went to bed and finally dozed off just before dawn. An hour later, I woke up to find her seated on the sofa in the room. I sat up, propped some pillows behind me and looked at her. She returned my gaze. It was Roger. She said, what did he want? I inquired. He wants me to sleep with him. I paused, contemplating my response. Again, I asked. She hesitated before nodding. It was a guess on my part, as I had no evidence they had previously been together. Her admission caught me off guard. How many times have you slept with him already? Twice. Why? I'm not entirely sure. Curiosity, perhaps the first time. And the second? He threatened to tell you if I refused. And now he's making the same threat again. Yes. I knew what my answer would be. I had never condoned infidelity in our marriage. In fact, I had made it clear what the consequences would be if either of us strayed. You understand that would mean the end of our marriage, don't you? Tears welled in her eyes as she nodded once more. I rose and made my way to the bathroom. No matter the chaos around you, when nature calls, you answer. After I'd flushed and washed up, I attended to my teeth and face, returned my toiletries to my bag, and opened the door. I'm heading home. You can join me or wait for him to pick you up. Packing up and vacating the room took only minutes. I settled the bill and we hopped into the car, embarking on the long journey with stops only for gas, restroom breaks, and fast food, as previously mentioned. The journey should have provided her with an opportunity to express remorse, seek forgiveness, or plead for another chance. Yet she remained silent on all accounts. Neither of us uttered a word throughout. At rest stops, she bought her own food, and I bought mine. If she needed to use the restroom, she never mentioned it. And whenever we halted, she was always the first one back in the car. Back home, after my first day back at work had ended, I found the house devoid of Lori's belongings, and I realized I hadn't enjoyed a proper meal in days. We had never utilized the town's sole food delivery service before, but I deemed it an opportune moment to give it a try. I visited their website, created an account, and placed an order. Forty minutes later, the doorbell rang, announcing the delivery. I collected my meal, tipped the driver generously on top of the gratuity included in the order, and eagerly anticipated enjoying it alongside a glass or two, or perhaps even six, of wine. I put my food on a tray and sat down to eat. I could see the TV and the street from where I sat. There was a car parked outside with someone sitting in the driver's seat. While I ate, I kept looking at the car because the driver didn't move. When I was halfway done with my meal, the driver was still sitting there. I took a sip of wine and went outside. When I got closer, I saw that the driver was actually the person delivering my food. She had tears on her face. Are you okay? I asked. No, my car won't start and I can't find anyone to help me, she said sadly. Initially, I hadn't paid much attention to her or her vehicle, preoccupied with my own thoughts. Everyone I know is occupied or unreachable, and my brother won't be available for another hour. 
Only then did I notice the child in the back seat clutching a book, appearing on the verge of tears as well. Would you like me to take a look? Oh, please. She exited the car, allowing me to take the driver's seat. I attempted to start the engine, but all I heard was a series of clicks followed by silence. Though far from a mechanic, I could recognize a dead battery. I fetched my car and attempted to jumpstart hers, but to no avail. It quickly became apparent that this was beyond my expertise. Why don't you both come inside? I'll call my cousin to have a look, I suggested. Reluctantly, they followed me indoors. Make yourselves at home while I give him a call. Fifteen minutes later, Jeff arrived, and within half an hour, her car was up and running. She expressed her gratitude, conversed with Jeff briefly, embraced him, and departed. The following two days at work were terrible. I hadn't confided in anyone about Lori, and my boss was constantly criticizing me, which I found exhausting. My personal life was in shambles, and my boss expected exceptional results from a project that was only marginally profitable. I decided it was time to have a serious conversation with him. I'm tired of you constantly criticizing me. I knew from the start that this project wasn't going to succeed, and I made that clear to you. I don't like giving ultimatums, but you have three options. Either back off and let me handle it my way, assign it to someone else, or I walk away. It's your call. I'm heading home. Let me know your decision. I was pretty sure he'd give me some time to cool off before asking me to return to work. Besides, I needed to start looking for a lawyer and begin the divorce process. That night, I called Jeff to ask if he wanted to go for a drink. I'd have wine or beer, but he'd probably stick to non-alcoholic beer. He said he had a date. Jeff used to date when we were in high school, and even when I was in college, he'd tell me about his dates and ask for advice. But he never mentioned if any of them went well. He's not one to brag, not even to me. He's a bit slow in life and really shy. He gets nervous around people he doesn't know. Wow, that's great news. Who's the lucky girl? I asked. Jenny, he said. Jenny who? The girl from the diner. Which diner? The one where your car broke down. Seriously? Yes. Well, Mr. Smooth Talker, how did that happen? After fixing her car, I told her to reach out if she needed more help, and she did. And you helped her again? He chuckled like a kid. Yep. So where are you taking her? Nowhere. Nowhere? Yeah. I'm going to her place. She's cooking dinner for me. I chuckled, genuinely happy for him, yet couldn't resist the urge to playfully rib him. You do know she's a vegan, right? What's that? It means she only eats plant-based foods. No meat, no eggs, no dairy. Jeff, being a classic meat and potatoes guy, couldn't fathom it. There are a couple of places around here that offer a free meal if you can finish an enormous steak. More like a roast along with all the trimmings. He suffered for two days afterward, but he did it. No meat, not even burgers. What am I going to eat? Well, there'll be plenty of salad. Maybe some beans. And if you're lucky, quinoa. Queen who? Not queen quinoa. It's a seed used in many vegan dishes. They used to feed it to animals in the Lake Titicaca region of South America before people started eating it. Titicaca what? I've lost my appetite. I chuckled over the phone. I'm just messing with you, Jeff. I have no clue what she eats, but I'm sure it'll be tasty. Go and enjoy yourself. With that, I hung up and decided to order dinner for myself. The next day, I lazed around the house. Lori was not home, and since I still had a long time left on the lease, I decided to make myself comfortable. I also thought my boss might call, say sorry, and offer me my job back. But by the afternoon, he hadn't called. Instead, his wife called. Tim, I'm tired of hearing your dad complain about you messing things up. You have a degree. Why don't you find another job if you two can't get along, she said. I'm thinking about it, Mom, but you know I'd have to move. That's the only downside, I replied. Why don't you just do what he wants, she asked. Because he's stuck in the past, I said. We need to modernize. Have you conveyed that to him? Repeatedly, but he's too stubborn to listen. Well, I don't want you to leave, so talk to him again. Okay, I promise. He'll come around and call me tomorrow, I'm sure. I'm looking right at him. Just go back to work tomorrow. He's nodding. It's fine. Now, why don't you and Lori come over for dinner tomorrow? Um, I'd be happy to, Mom, but she won't be there. Why not? I had postponed telling them, but decided it was time. 
I started telling her, and she relayed to my father until he told her to put me on speaker. When I finished, he got on the phone. Here's the plan. I'm firing you so you'll be jobless. When it goes to court, you won't have income so you won't have to pay her alimony. You'll get your job back after the divorce. I told you she was trouble and she proved it. You're better off without her, added my mother. Thank you both, but I'll handle it. See you at the office, Dad. I'll see you tomorrow for dinner. I spent a good part of the next day trying to explain why and how I thought changes would benefit the company, but my father was more interested in hearing about Lori and saying, I told you so. After work, we had dinner with my mother, and I had to revisit the Lori story and endure more I told you so's from my father, while my mother chimed in with her own. When I arrived home later, Lori was waiting on the porch. It marked the first encounter since our failed trip. Bathed in the porch light, she was visible. I parked in the garage and entered the house from there. As I approached the front door, the doorbell chimed. I switched off the porch light before heading to the switch, then proceeded to take a shower. By the time I finished, she had vanished. Securing legal representation proved straightforward. However, finding an attorney willing to tackle a divorce involving Roger Justin, whether directly or indirectly, posed a greater challenge. Yet, I succeeded. Count me in. His father sold me a lemon of a car, and he never rectified it. Thus, the process commenced. The paperwork, the consultations, the negotiations with Lori and her lawyer. I never talked directly to her. Besides, one time I went to her house and ignored her. She didn't want to talk to me either. And honestly, I didn't want to talk to her either because she hurt me so much. Jeff told me Lori got a new job at a different car dealership, and Roger didn't come around much anymore. People said Roger left her for someone better. Meanwhile, Jeff and Jenny were getting along great, and Jenny's daughter really liked him. Jeff spent a lot of time with them and seemed happier than ever. The more he talked about his relationship with Jenny, the more I realized I'd been feeling pretty alone lately. I just went from work to home, sometimes stopping at the lawyer's office, the store, or my parents' house. My dad was fed up with hearing about it. I told you so's and even made a couple of attempts to grasp my ideas for improving the company. Mom kept finding potential matches for me, but I kept turning them down. In our small town, I had no clue there were so many single, eligible women. I swear she must have put out an ad. Handsome, college-educated, 28-year-old man going through a divorce seeks suitable partner. Must be honest, faithful, and trustworthy. Must enjoy music, theater, fine wines, and good food. After the fifth date she set up for me, I stopped answering her calls and told my dad that if he ever mentioned setting me up again, I'd move to Houston. I finally spoke to Lori on the day our divorce was finalized. The judge banged the gavel, declared the marriage over, and I approached her. Was it worth it? I asked before walking away without waiting for her answer. Jeff used to take care of keeping my car clean, but had stopped because he got too busy cleaning Jenny's car. One Saturday as I was washing my car, Jeff pulled into the driveway with Jenny and her daughter Sophie, who was around seven or eight years old. They were heading to the mall and invited me along. Setting aside my sponge and drying my hands, I agreed, even though going to the mall out of boredom felt like scraping the bottom of the barrel for entertainment. After about an hour at the mall, I was starting to second-guess my decision when we passed an ice cream stand, and Sophie asked if she could have some. Jenny replied, Not now, sweetie. It's too close to dinner. Disregarding the timing, I interjected, Forget that. Come on, Soph. I want some, too. Sophie eagerly took my hand and we dashed off. We'll catch up with you later, I called back to Jenny. As we strolled, enjoying our ice cream cones and holding hands, Sophie explained, We have to hold hands. My mommy says she doesn't want us to get lost in the crowd, so I have to hold her hand. I don't want you to get lost either, so I'll hold yours. That's a good idea, I agreed. We had been strolling for a few minutes, and when she wasn't enjoying her ice cream cone, she was chatting away. Suddenly, I felt myself thrown to the ground and was knocked unconscious when my head hit the floor. When I regained consciousness, I found myself in handcuffs, surrounded by police officers and an angry crowd. I glanced around and saw Sophie crying, being comforted by a woman. What on earth? Just be quiet, scumbag. We'll deal with you soon enough. It's all right, Sophie, I heard the woman saying. He can't harm you anymore. He wasn't harming me. He bought me ice cream. 
I know, sweetie. Sometimes bad men do nice things. He's not a bad man, Aunt Louise. Where's my mom? I've called her. She's on her way. Is Tim okay? Who's Tim? Him, she pointed at me. Every time I tried to speak, a police officer silenced me. Do you know him? Yes, he's Jeff's cousin. We were out shopping. Oh my God, Aunt Louise said. Then she talked to one of the policemen. I think I made a mistake. Jesus, lady, don't say that, he replied, looking at the crowd. We better get him out of here before they tear him apart. He grabbed my arm and said, let's go. Some of the people from the crowd followed us to the security office. I heard them saying things like, castrate the jerk and let us at him. I started to feel scared, and every time I tried to speak, one of the officers told me to be quiet. They promised me a chance to talk later. They took me into a room, searched me, emptied my pockets, and put handcuffs on me. Eventually, two officers entered, removed the restraints, returned my belongings, and began to apologize. Jenny and Jeff followed suit. My sister mistook you for someone else while you were with Sophie and assumed the worst. As I rubbed my sore wrists, I recalled seeing people on TV do the same after being released from handcuffs. I now understood why. The discomfort was real. Feeling a mix of anger, shock, lingering fear, and nerves, I was bombarded with inquiries from Jeff about my well-being, while Jenny continued to express remorse and Sophie clung tightly to her. Turning to one of the officers, I inquired, Can I leave now? Yes, sir. But before you go, we need you to sign a release form. After everything, being thrown to the ground, handcuffed, and insulted, I won't sign anything until I've spoken to my lawyer. I exited the room into a larger area where a mall security officer stood by the door. Is this the way out? Yes, sir, but I'd advise against it. Why? Because there are people outside who believe you're a child predator and they're waiting for you. Good grief. Could this day get any worse? Can't you set the record straight? We've tried. We'll escort you out through the rear, offered a police sergeant. Clearly, someone had rifled through my wallet and knew my name. Take him to my car, Jeff instructed. The sergeant turned to me. Would you prefer us to drop you off at home? We'll use an unmarked car. Let's go. My frustration wasn't directed at Jeff, Jenny, or even Aunt Louise. I simply wanted to leave, and I figured the safest and quickest way was with police assistance. At the rear entrance, Aunt Louise intercepted me. I'm terribly sorry. I saw you with Sophie and feared you were abducting her. I took a deep breath. I understand, but I've been attacked, knocked unconscious, and there's a mob out there, gesturing toward the main office door, intent on castrating me. It's probably not the best time to engage in conversation. Then addressing the sergeant, take me home. After providing my address, neither of us spoke until we arrived at my driveway. My phone had been ringing incessantly, but I chose to ignore it. I wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone. As I prepared to exit his car at home, he halted me. But from my perspective, I'd rather err on the side of caution than risk a young girl being abducted because someone saw something and remained silent. I'll take good Samaritans like Louise Garner any day. I understand and appreciate your viewpoint, but tonight, my name and face will likely be plastered all over the news. Even though it's a mistake, sensationalism will prevail. The news will eventually correct the error, but many won't believe it. And I'll be marked for life. Thank you for the ride home. It may not turn out as dire as you fear. I'll see what I can do. Yeah, and pigs might fly, I muttered to myself. I hopped into my car and headed straight for my parents' place. That evening, we tuned into the local news, and there it was, already playing when we flipped to the right channel. We missed the beginning but caught wind of the message. See something, say something, even if it turns out to be a mistake. Failing to speak up could mean sealing the fate of an innocent child. Luckily, they didn't mention my name or show my picture. The commentator concluded with, We've opted not to reveal the gentleman's identity out of concern that his life would suffer further upheaval. Personally, I extend my heartfelt apologies. This is Louise Garner signing off. Good night. You dodged a bullet, said my dad. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as I thought. I replied. So what now? Asked my mom. I guess I'll just forget about it.
If I sued for getting arrested by mistake, it would just make me more famous and I don't want that, I said. The police were just doing what they thought was right at the time. On my way home, I realized I forgot my phone. Upon checking it, I found eight messages awaiting me. Three were from Jeff, expressing apologies for what had transpired and conveying Jenny's distress. The remaining calls were from the city police and a local TV station, but I didn't bother listening to those. It wasn't until later that I recalled the sign-off from the TV news anchor, This is Louise Garner. Good night. Holy crap. What had the police sergeant said about me? I'll take good Samaritans like Louise Garner any day. Well, damn. I hadn't paid much attention to her at the mall, so I didn't recognize her on TV. I suppose the makeup altered her appearance. I rang Jeff because I knew he'd be concerned about me. Are you all right? He inquired. I'm okay, still a bit shaken. How's Sophie? She's fine. She got scared when the police apprehended you and she dropped her ice cream. But once we got her another one and reassured her that you were fine, she settled down. I'm relieved she's all right. Did you catch the news? We caught most of it. Missed the beginning. That was actually the most interesting part. Why's that? Louise confessed to instigating the whole incident. She saw her niece with a stranger and panicked. She trailed you while on the phone with the police, distrustful of the mall security. She made sure the police knew where you were until they arrived. She took full responsibility and admitted she might do the same again under similar circumstances. I suppose I can see where she's coming from. She was worried you might flee with Sophie before the police arrived, so she kept an eye out for anything she could use to defend herself. She genuinely feels remorseful. Why didn't you inform me earlier that Jenny's sister was on TV? I didn't consider it relevant. I suppose it isn't. When Jenny brought food to my house that night, I got the impression she needed money. But if her sister is a TV personality, she can't be struggling too much. It's local programming, so Louise doesn't earn much. I'm not sure how much exactly, but it's not a substantial amount. Jenny is like most of us, just getting by without much extra. If she wants something more, she has to work for it. She's saving up for a vacation, so she has a side job delivering food. Good for her. Yeah. He paused. I like her, Tim, and she likes me. She doesn't mind that I'm slow. I smiled. Jeff, it doesn't matter how fast you go. Your friends don't care what others think, I said. After a few days, everything went back to normal, and we never talked about what happened at the mall again. I hadn't seen Jenny or Sophie, but Jeff and I talked every couple of days like we always did. Then one Saturday morning, the doorbell rang. I was eating biscuits and gravy when I answered the door and saw Louise Garner standing there. Good morning, are you busy? She asked. Not really, I replied. I was just applying ointment to my wrists to alleviate the discomfort from handcuffs. Tim, if I may address you as such, I am deeply sorry. Oh, it's all right. Having been in handcuffs, my acquaintances in the neighborhood now show me more respect. Perhaps I should go. No, no, please come in. I was just speaking with my parole officer on the phone. She gazed at me with a hint of sadness. I can only apologize so many times. Sorry to have disturbed you. She started to leave. Wait a moment, I interjected. There was no need for me to be impolite. She halted. I'm still a little hurt, but I'll get over it. Well, when you do give me a call. She handed me a card. I owe you at least a lunch. I'm not sure about lunch, but have you had breakfast? Actually, no. Do you enjoy biscuits and gravy? Sausage gravy? Yes, one of my favorites, she replied with a smile. I widened the door for her entrance. Once in the kitchen, I handed her a plate and gestured toward the stove where the biscuits and gravy sat. Need me to warm up the gravy? I offered. I can manage if it's all right with you, she replied. Be my guest. Would you like some coffee? Yes, please. Sugar? Cream? Um, this might sound weird, but do you have any chocolate milk? In your coffee? I asked. Yes, she said hesitantly. I know it's strange, but... She was only the second person I knew who mixed chocolate milk with coffee. I was the other. Although for the past few years I'd been using Bailey's instead. Did Jeff suggest that? She asked. What, putting chocolate milk in your coffee? No, why? I thought I was the only one who did that, or at least until now. You sure Jeff didn't mention it? I've been adding chocolate milk to my coffee since I started drinking it. 
My whole family does. Even Sophie when Jenny lets her. Well, I don't have any chocolate milk, but I do have Bailey's. The rest of the morning passed quickly and pleasantly, and Louise became a convert to Bailey's in her coffee. That initial breakfast marked the beginning of many shared meals between us. Our relationship blossomed, with me becoming her avid TV companion. Our first kiss happened on our third date, followed by our first intimate encounter three weeks later. My first, since Lori and I had our failed attempt at rekindling our relationship, where I discovered her infidelity. After Jeff and Jenny became a couple, Jeff pursued his passion for when Jeff moved in with Jenny, Louise and I pitched in to help. Sophie, always by his side, seemed inseparable from him. Witnessing them holding hands, I remarked to Sophie about her preventing Jeff from getting lost, to which she replied, it was the most beautiful thing she could say about him. A year post-divorce, I heard Lori was tying the knot again, not with Roger Justin, but with a guy from the city sanitation department. They'd known each other for five months. I silently wished him well, anticipating he'd need it. I'd come to terms long ago that I didn't hate or dislike her. Marrying hastily was on both of us, though the cheating was solely her fault. Things went smoothly for almost two years. Jeff and Jenny were gearing up for their wedding with Louise as a bridesmaid and myself as the best man. Their parents split when Louise, the youngest, was four. Their brother would walk Jenny down the aisle. With my house lease expired, I moved in with Louise. Marriage was never on the table, and we both seemed content, even amidst Jeff and Jenny's wedding preparations. Without any talk of tying the knot ourselves. Unbeknownst to Louise, the producer of her news program compiled some of her old videos and sent them to larger markets. Impressed he aimed to help her career progress. One day, she got a call from a TV station in Houston. The news director had seen several of her videos and requested more. Ultimately, he invited her to Houston for a discussion. She was thrilled, and we discussed it. It was her dream come true, so we agreed she should go. After the interview, she informed me that one of the videos he saw, which caught his interest, was the one where she mistakenly thought I was kidnapping Sophie. The meeting went well. They essentially gave her an on-camera audition and promised to get back to her. They did two weeks later, offering her a job. For me, the decision to accept the job was obvious. It represented a significant step toward a potential national position, the ambition of every broadcaster. My stubborn father had finally agreed to a few things my way, and the change was paying off. Our business was doing well, and I loved it. Everyone was happy. My dad, me, our employees, and our finances looked good. But moving to Houston wasn't possible for me. It was about four hours away, but Louise and I thought we could handle the distance and still keep our relationship strong. And we did for about six months. But then, we started seeing each other and talking less. We couldn't watch her on TV because our cable company didn't have the channel. So I often watched her online. In just three months, she went from being a news anchor to hosting a talk show where she talked with guests and the audience about different things. They showed up at almost every charity event in their area. Sometimes you'd see their pictures in the newspaper or online looking like they were having a great time. And strangely, so was I. Running my growing business took up more and more of my time. The only downside was sleeping alone, at least for me. I didn't think she was seeing her good-looking co-host or anyone else. But with Lori as my only reference, the idea bothered me. On Wednesday morning, I decided to drive to Houston to surprise her. I told my dad I was taking the rest of the week off to visit her. It's been a while and I think we need to talk, I said. I'd rather you wait, he insisted. I can't delay it any longer. Immediately after our conversation, Jeff called, requesting assistance that afternoon and inquiring about my availability. I'm heading to Houston. I'll return on Sunday, I informed him. That's too late, he responded. What's so urgent that it can't wait, I queried. It's something concerning Jenny, he explained. Jeff, I apologize, but I can't help. I'm committed to going to Houston. Their morning show aired live daily. They spent their afternoons researching guests and planning for the next day's program. Their work extended beyond the hour-long show. They dedicated full days to research and program development. I arrived at her apartment shortly after midday. Planning to wait for her there, I discovered that my key no longer granted me access. 
After ringing the bell with no response, I approached the building manager's office to request a new key. Though she recognized me warmly, she informed me of a new policy. I'm sorry, but I can't assist you. Why not? We now require the leaseholder's authorization for key issuance or entry with a physical signature. But you know me. Yes, sir, I do. But rules are rules. May I pose a question? Sure. Would it matter if I were her spouse? That depends on the lease signer. Only they can authorize it. Recognizing the impasse, I left her office and passed through the parking garage to my car. Her designated spot was vacant. Dialing her number, I received no response, so I left a message. She called back a few minutes later. Hi, sweetie, she greeted when I answered. Hey, how's it going? Oh, not much. How about you? I was thinking of visiting this weekend. That sounds great. I should be done with the project we're involved in by Friday. Which project is that? It's one of the charities our boss supports. We're organizing a contest with prizes for top contributors. It's fun, but a lot of work. Are you working on it today? No, I needed a break, so I took the afternoon off. And what are you up to? Just chilling. Good for you. Rest up and I'll see you on Friday. Okay, take care. Love you. Bye. I tried to say love you, but it wouldn't come out. I walked back through the garage, passing where her car usually was, and took the elevator to her floor. I rang her doorbell many times, waiting each time, but she didn't answer. I thought about leaving but also considered staying to keep watching her, wondering if I should call her and tell her where I was. But I decided not to because she had chosen what she wanted, even if it wasn't what I hoped for. So I left, driving home slowly. When I got there, I saw two cars in the driveway and two more on the street. One was my parents' car, and the other was Jeff's. I wasn't in the mood for visitors and was surprised to see them because they thought I was going to be away all week. I parked and opened the garage with my remote. To my surprise, Louise's car was inside. When I got out of the car, Jeff was at the kitchen door and invited me inside. He guided me to the living room where my parents, Jenny, Sophie, Jenny, and Louise's mother and brother and Louise herself were gathered. Wearing a nervous expression, Jeff nudged me towards her, and despite the smiles around us, Louise appeared apprehensive. I approached her, and to my astonishment, she knelt down on one knee, her sincerity evident. Tim, I adore you. If you're going to abduct anyone, let it be me so we can have our happily ever after. Will you marry me? She queried, holding a small box towards me. The day's events dissolved as I opened the box, revealing a gold ring adorned with a diamond. She remained kneeling as I inspected the ring closely. As I began to slide it onto my finger, she intervened. No, silly, that's the wedding ring. You can't wear it until the wedding if there's going to be one because you haven't answered me yet. Glancing at the room's occupants, then back at her, I replied, Sure, why not? Cheers erupted. Romantic? Hardly. But I said it with a grin as I embraced her. You're such a tease, she remarked after we kissed. Choosing today of all days to come see me, you nearly messed everything up. My father gave me a reassuring pat on the back. We didn't know what to do. You insisted on going to Houston and Louise was en route here. Even Jeff tried to dissuade you. We consulted with her, and she assured us that you'd likely return this evening, so we went ahead with the plans. What was so urgent that you insisted on going today? Glancing at those gathered, I confessed. Honestly? Yes, everyone chorused except Sophie and Louise. Louise spoke up, offering, Let me try to explain. She paused, took a deep breath, and clasped both of my hands in hers. In recent months, it seems like we've been drifting apart, she began, living separate lives, miles away from each other, content in our own jobs and routines, yet sensing an absence. She reminisced about her time in Houston, recalling the parties, the fun, and the people, everything she desired in life. My job is fulfilling, she admitted, but my life feels incomplete. I can't share these wonderful moments with you. Tears welled in her eyes as she confessed. I knew if I felt this way you must too if you truly loved me. The desire to share every aspect of our lives, the highs and the successes. She paused, seeking confirmation. All I could do was nod in agreement. I love you, Tim, with all my heart. I love you too, I replied, meaning every word. 
The atmosphere lightened then as Sophie, Jeff, and Jenny bid their farewells. Sophie, lingering, asked in a whisper, So are you my uncle now? I lifted her in a hug and whispered back, Yes, good. After they departed, Louise and I settled onto the sofa, each with a glass of wine, reclining comfortably, enjoying each other's company. Do you know why else I went to Houston today? I inquired. I think I might, she replied. Why's that? You were worried about me living there alone and the possibility of me getting involved with someone else. Is that true? What, getting involved with someone else? Yes. No. The only men I really interacted with were my producer, the studio crew, and Thomas. Thomas was her co-host. It's Thomas I was most concerned about. All those events you attended and your photos in the papers. I was worried and jealous. She leaned in and kissed me. Oh, silly. I could have told you that Thomas was gay and you had nothing to worry about. But that wouldn't have been true. The reality is he's the most conceited person I've ever encountered. He expects people, especially women, to adore him. We worked well together, but personally I don't care for him. And he doesn't care for me either. She took a sip of her wine. I wouldn't lie about him being gay, but I did lie to you. I chuckled. Yes, you did, my building manager added. On my way here, your father called to say you were coming home soon. I called the manager and told her what was going on. She said she'd take care of it. She called me back soon after to say maintenance was coming to change the lock on my door. We thought if you could get into the apartment, you might stay, even with the delay, and we didn't want that. I knew you wouldn't stick around for explanations, so I did this instead. I apologize for the deception, but I was certain it would bring you back here, where I intended to propose in the presence of your family. Can you forgive me? Absolutely, I replied without hesitation, and I apologize for my lackluster response. I was taken aback. She chuckled. We were all hoping for that. Well, you got it, I said, leaning in to kiss her. I adored this woman, then took another sip of wine. When are you heading back to Houston? I inquired, remembering her distant show. Tonight or tomorrow? Hmm, she pondered. Let's discuss that. Today's show was pre-recorded on Monday. Tomorrow's and Friday's were done yesterday. Friday's will announce my departure as I want to return home to my future husband. I stared at her, processing the news. That's all right, isn't it? Of course, it's more than all right. It's fantastic. But won't you miss it? Yes, but I miss you more. I wanted to convince my old job to let me make a program about local heroes, talent, events, and people. I want to keep doing that until... Until when? Until the baby comes. After that, we'll figure it out. I took a sip of wine while she watched me. Did you catch what I just said? I did. I just didn't realize Jenny was pregnant. She shook her head. She's not silly, I am. Oh, oh! I managed to keep from dropping my glass as I placed it on the table and embraced her. Our life is wonderful. Louise is back at her old job hosting a similar show to the one she did in Houston. Only now she does it solo. Our daughter Danielle is so pretty. Our business is doing really well. Sophie is excited for the day she can walk with Danielle and hold her hand to keep her from wandering off. Second story. My fiancé, F24, cheated on me, F23, with a man. Advice? My fiancé cheated on me with a man, and I'm really lost about what to do. This is completely unexpected because she's always been very masculine and not interested in men at all. She's never been intimate with a man before, or at least that's what I thought. I checked her phone yesterday and found 111 deleted messages from a number. They were sending each other naked pictures and videos, and it makes me feel so sick. I can't stop crying whenever I think about it. It's like a knot in my stomach. Their conversations were really explicit, and it seems they had sex. I don't know when it happened, but she got upset and angry when he didn't respond, saying he's still immature and hasn't changed since the last time. She even said the sex wasn't good and needed improvement. It's hard to understand why she did this when she always tells me how attractive she finds me. I'm just so confused and sick about it all. She's always been clear that she's never been with a man before, not even kissed one. I don't know what to do. Can anyone offer some advice? I love her deeply, but she's cheated on me twice before with her ex-girlfriend from high school. I can't help feeling like this is somehow my fault. 
maybe because I don't satisfy her sexually, even though I give her all my love and attention. I feel like she finds me annoying a lot of the time, and I know we don't have enough sex. I feel trapped and so unwell. Also, I should mention I've only ever been in relationships with men before her. I've been with one other woman besides her, but she's my first serious relationship with a woman, and we're engaged and even remodeling a house together.